Welcome to this Sony webinar on making the break for the video and film industry. We'll talk about how to do what you love and earn a living by being a filmmaker in this day and age with a great range of guests. I'm Nino Leitner, a director of photography and blogger. You might know our site cinema5d.com where we focus on filmmaking gear, reviews and news. And after this brief clip about my work, I'll introduce you to our eclectic range of guests. Well, let's start off with a little bit of housekeeping about this webinar. Uh, it's going to last about one hour. Um, we'll have polls uh, during um, the transmission, so you can uh, give your answers um, and you will see the questions and answers um, options on screen and you can give us our ans uh, your answers in real time. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the very end and uh, please feel free to join our discussion and join the conversation by using the hashtag make the break on Twitter, uh, Facebook and Instagram. We'll monitor that and these questions uh, will be part of the Q&A as well. Um, let's start off by introducing our guests. Um, this is Toby from YouTube. Um, tell us a little bit about what you do for YouTube and how you ended up doing that and uh, how is YouTube um, helping filmmakers? Cool, so basically I'm Toby Dell. I'm a program strategist for YouTube Spaces Amir. So essentially I look after the education strategy of YouTube Space London and YouTube Space Berlin. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the YouTube Spaces. So essentially YouTube Spaces in a variety of cities, we have six of them at the moment. So essentially they are high-end production uh, facilities where we invite YouTube creators of all ranges to come in and make videos, essentially taking their content to the next level. Cool. Uh, next off, let's um, introduce Craig and Ben from Southampton Solent University. But before we do that, we will watch a brief clip about Solent Productions. <laughs> Solent I was drawn to purely because I love the lecturers when I met them. Uh, they made a really good impression and also the equipment that we have here seemed great. The sheer amount of like technology and like the facilities they had, the amount of studios, the amount of editing suites, like there's just a massive amount of things we can get our hands on. It's just great to get hands on experience in the sort of professional world. You can really get that here. So I feel the course is going to help me after university get somewhere. Cool, so this looks really hands-on, much more hands-on um, as when I was studying at Solent University, Southampton Solent University about 10 years ago for a semester, uh, but I still loved it. Uh, Craig, tell us a little bit about Solent Productions. What is this program? <coughs> okay, so my name's Craig Lees. I'm an associate producer at Solent Productions, and we try and give uh, a lot more real-world work experience for our students. So we give them live environments to work in, uh, working with clients, internal, external ones, and many things like music festivals and our work with Solent TV, which Ben will talk to you about. Cool. So it's hands-on experience for students while they are still studying. Basically. Exactly. Uh, ben, you're heading the uh, Solent TV channel, I heard. So we're, we're on one of the team members at Solent TV, which is the university's web channel. It's a, it's a new project for the university uh, that we're developing and helping students develop uh, their own content for YouTube and the web, for example. Cool. And our final guest is Adrian Tanner. Uh, you're a director and filmmaker and you just um, are about to finish production on your first long feature film, right? We're about to finish post-production on Redistributors, which we shot last summer. Uh, and that was a culmination of years of editing firstly and then making shorts and having a production company and filmmaking, uh, which had always been geared towards features. And now finally I've made one. Cool. So let's look at the trailer for your film um, so we actually know what we're talking about. I think Liz Gill is our mole. The leak came from her computer. Can I have some privacy, please? I have another job for you. 
It's urgent. When you try to change the world, or whatever it is you think you're doing, you destroy a lot of people's lives, people who worked with you, who trusted you. We know where you are. There will always be winners and losers. Weak and strong. We will always protect our interests. Beautiful stuff, I have to say. Uh, shot on a Sony A7S. Yep. Wow, it's amazing how much quality you can get out of really inexpensive equipment these days. I'm still constantly amazed at my own productions, what is possible with little money, right? We'll talk about a little bit more about this production later on. But let's start, up, start off with a poll question to our audience. What do you personally think is the most important measure of success? Is it your job status? Is it salary and earnings? You want to be a celebrity? What is it for you that um, really, you know, what do you think makes you more successful and what is the most, uh, yeah, what's most important to you, basically? Um, Toby, let's start off with you. Um, so you mentioned the YouTube space in the beginning. Um, it's basically production facilities for YouTubers. Um, how does it work? How do you actually, so let's say I have a YouTube channel with X amount of uh, subscribers. How do I sign up? How do I actually... You know, what can I sh shoot in your place and what's there? Okay, cool. So we do kind of like a variety of different things in these spaces. So we have Learn. So essentially this is where we kind of offer a whole variety of different workshops. So we kind of have a Build Your Channel uh, work, essentially a kind of an education and curriculum. So essentially these are open access and available to anyone with a YouTube channel. So this is going about how to optimize your YouTube channel, how to go about kind of finding the fundamentals of YouTube, essentially um, the very basics of setting up a YouTube channel and basically how to go and optimize it. Then we have produce great content. So essentially this is more your hands-on practical kind of filmmaking advice. This can go from kind of your camera courses to your post-production courses. So essentially teaching creators how to create better content. And then we have Boost Your Brand, which is essentially kind of taking these kind of YouTube creators and showing them how to brand themselves, how to market their videos to kind of the next, le the next level up. Um, then we have Connect. So essentially this is kind of where we basically connect YouTube creators together. This kind of spawns organic collaboration between creators. And then we have Create. So in London, if you have over 5,000 subscribers, you can kind of come in and use one of our high-end high -end production facilities and use one of our large studios to shoot your next video. Cool. We just got in our poll uh, results, okay. so um, what, do you, what do you think people selected? The creation of art, I hope. Yeah? Well, almost. Uh, job satisfaction um, by a huge majority is 48% uh, selected. The yeah, second one is fair. creation of art. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. fantastic. That's, that's a really great. great result. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you there. But yeah. the, um, regarding the... Where, where, you know, there are several locations of mm -hmm. YouTube spaces, right? So we have six in total. Um, let's hope I can remember them all right now. So we have Los Angeles, we have New York, we have London, we have Tokyo, we have Sao Paulo, and we have Berlin. So essentially we're reaching all around the globe now. So if you're a YouTube creator within the vicinity of any of those areas, go and find yourself a YouTube space and you can kind of learn. And how do you manage people? I mean, how do you actually okay. prevent everybody from going there? Okay, cool. So we do have these limitations. So if you want to produce content there, essentially you'll have to kind of have a certain amount of subscribers. So in London it's 5,000 subscribers, in Berlin it's 1,000 subscribers, and these vary from space to space. So it kind of reflects the, how active people are in, in exactly. virtual countries. It reflects the YouTube, YouTube ecosystem. So obviously there's a lot of creators who are huge over in LA and New York, so we kind of push those limits up a little bit further. So I think they're 10,000 subscribers. Cool. So this is a general question. Um, how do you all think YouTube and other online video creation sites and video um, sites are, how important are they in today's ecosystem of, you know, filmmaking and, and broadcasting in general? Well, it's, it's, it's kind of massively changed the landscape in, in so many ways. It's sort of a, a career choice that a lot of our students probably wouldn't have even really been thinking about. Even a few years ago, they kind of want to go and work in uh, TV or on film. And then this, this whole possibility of becoming a, a, a content creator for yourself online is really changing the way that students are kind of approaching their development and how they're going to go on in the future after leaving university, I think. Yeah, I think it's a great, powerful thing for independent filmmaking. It was, the film industry still is very difficult to get into, um, whereas independents who are 
writing their own scripts, making their own films. It's a massive opportunity just to prove to people they can do this, they can all do different disciplines of filmmaking and put themselves out there. So basically, it's interesting to see for me that the university side is now kind of approaching this online world through your production program and the TV, um, whereas YouTube is kind of people who started without a formal education, uh, just doing their videos, are basically offering kind of formal education through YouTube space. So it's kind of mm -hmm. coming together from both sides, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think we find those worlds more and more merging together. Uh, an example I can think of is we have a lot of self-growing creators who are essentially you know, producing self-made content, sketches and short films. And then recently a few of them have had funding from Ron Howard, the filmmaker, as an example. And that's really where traditional and kind of this new media really kind of bridge together in finding these new opportunities available. Who is currently creating a storm on YouTube? Who is the biggest one or one of the biggest ones? One of the first people that jumps into my head is a guy called Casey Neistat, who's basically this filmmaker who lives in New York. So he has a background of creating more kind of traditional films. So he has like an independent film background. He's made commercials and music videos. But more recently, he's kind of opted to make uh, basically a daily vlog. So essentially, he's kind of telling stories every day about his daily life. So these, this may sound mundane, but he tells it in such an interesting, you know, an informative manner. He's attracted hundreds of thousands of people to go to his YouTube channel every single day to find out what he's up to. Uh, and he's really creating a storm. Um, I think it's a huge opportunity for that to grow as a storyteller and a filmmaker to produce so much content like that. And he's really attracting a whole new audience to that kind of formatting. Yeah. So Adrian, your film is more, um, the way you market it is probably more traditional way. Uh, where do you think, you know, the future for marketing in general uh, for feature films like yours um, in the online world? Well, I think uh, YouTube is obviously a bit of a no-brainer. If you can get content on there, then that's brilliant for your film. But obviously, <coughs> with respect to people who are successful on YouTube, that's as much of an art as creating a good feature film. So you're obviously going to be dividing your effort. So in, in the case of this film, we put all of our effort into the traditional filmmaking process and making the film as well as we could. And now we've got a very nearly finished film. I'm quite excited to talk to Toby later about how we can maximise YouTube and so on. Um, we've got a bit of content we shot during the shoot, but I think, uh, obviously, it was a smaller film, so we didn't really have the resources to document what we were doing, even though it was quite an exciting adventure for us. Cool. Um, out of your students at Southampton Solon University, are there many YouTubers, or are people more like the traditional route, you know, like looking to become directors after they graduate, or...? Well, oops, sorry. Um, sure, well, yeah, I mean, hundreds of our students probably have their own YouTube channels. Uh, we have some students who've gone on to be quite successful in YouTube, like uh, Gary Turk, who made the, um, the Look Up viral video, sort of a spoken word um, thing. He came from Southern University and he went on to make a, a, a very widely viewed video um, about the dangers of social media, but it was passed around socially, so it's kind of a bit of a strange video to become so popular. But, um, but yeah, students can go on and make real careers out of this. Cool. So, Toby, what, what do you think, I mean, you probably know best, uh, what constitutes a successful YouTube video or a creator? What does it mean? Because, I mean, you know, it was very easy, I'm not easy, but it, you know, in the beginnings uh, of YouTube, it was mostly cat videos and, mm -hmm. and crying babies that generated millions of views. Um, I think the mechanism of how you can make a successful video is, is, is changing and quality is increasing. What is the current way of measuring that and how do you do that? So definitely, yeah. So I imagine it's really, we really want to kind of get a sense of what you mean by successful YouTube creator because people want to kind of create a viral video and that would be a kind of a one-hit goal. But essentially, that's not what we're really kind of pushing the creators to do on the platform. We're pushing creators to make consistent content for high-quality videos. That will draw more of an audience. And we used to measure these on views. So viral videos would be, you know, an amazing way of getting that, huge amount of views. But now we kind of we push the algorithm to do something called watch time. So essentially, this calculates your viewing session through audience retention. So no longer are you can click on and watch a whole 10-second video. We kind of want to push the viewer to watch more and more content on YouTube. So essentially, what this does is this pushes the uh, content that people enjoy to the forefront of YouTube. So essentially, if people are watching the whole video, that's what we want to sing and shout out about. And what's a good recipe, a typical recipe of, of you know, having a really successful channel, putting out regular content and mm -hmm. stuff like that. 
I would say whatever it is that you want to do, and there's a huge niche of markets that you can kind of create for you on YouTube. If you've got a niche, do it, because you'll find that there is an audience for it on YouTube. But I would just say you want to retain a credibility and integrity. So on any platform, YouTube is the most important that you have authenticity, because you're having a one-on-one -on -one connection with a viewer, and it's very important that you're kind of honest with them. Yeah. Do you think that, sorry, do you think that anybody can, can do it? Do you think that anybody can kind of become a YouTuber? So you're sort of talking about Casey Neistat mm -hmm. earlier. I mean, he's got quite a big personality and he's also a great mm -hmm. visual storyteller with, with the medium. So do you, but do you think that anybody can kind of get to that or do you need to be a personality really? It really depends. I think um, personality really does work on YouTube and if you look at the content that's kind of pushed to the top, you'll kind of notice that straight away. Um, I think being likeable is something, you know, some people are great at, some people aren't. But I think the personality is the key for YouTube. It's what attracts viewers and what makes people return again week, week on, week on after another. I mean, Adrian, if you were to make, you know, a video series about your foregoings into your short, your film, That'd be a really interesting to kind of filmmakers around the world to kind of experience that with you, um, and your yeah, personality would show that. Yeah, well, there, there's interesting. There, there probably is a niche for shy people, right? yeah, who, who who represent what it's like to be not particularly telegenic or you know, on YouTube. So <laughs> yeah. I guess anyway, everybody can win. I completely agree. So let's put up another poll question for our audience: um, How do you measure success on YouTube or Vimeo? Is it the number of channel subscribers, video views, you know, how many people, how much your videos are watched, uh, you know, frequency, how many videos do you publish? What do you think is, uh, constitutes a successful YouTuber or, I actually don't like the word to be honest, it's like more like video creator who puts stuff online, okay. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's move on to another question for you. Uh, I mean, you kind of already answered how YouTube helps individuals um, who want to move from the you know, typical vlogging stuff to mm -hmm. more serious filmmaking. It's uh, through, the, through the YouTube spaces uh, and workshops that you're doing there. But um, are there any tips and tricks uh, for building online audiences that kind of work, that kind of, you know, over the years you have seen mm -hmm. that this works, this doesn't? Um, I think there's a host of different methods. I think the number one that we always sing and shout out about is collaboration with other YouTube creators. Sorry to use the word again. <laughs> um, so essentially, if you have an audience and another person has an audience, to combine those and kind of reach both audiences, you're kind of you know, appealing to a whole new group of people that may really enjoy your work and subscribe to your channel. I think that's the number one way of going about um, you know, growing your audience. But also there's kind of a number of different methods we kind of um, detail in 10 Fundamentals of YouTube. Um, we say about you know, create tentpole programming. What are people searching for and how can your content relate to that? Um, think about the platform, think about what you watch on YouTube and how you can kind of show up in those search results. So if there's a big movie coming out, perhaps you're going to give your opinion on that franchise. You know, people make videos around Halloween, you know, we have a, on Halloween every year, surge, like viewers surge to watch kind of makeup, spooky makeup tutorials because they're getting ready for a Halloween party. And it makes complete sense. So to use those kind of tips and tricks is kind of what's going to make your content key and also to me like I said before maintain consistency you should be making at least one video a week so that you're kind of consistently recognizable as a creator yeah I think catering a niche is a very good point because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people try to you know try to have something which is very wide for a mm -hmm. wide audience but at the same time this makes it really hard to reach anybody exactly uh, because it's exactly five years ago uh, gaming videos on YouTube were a niche why would anyone want to watch uh, you know, someone play through a video game on YouTube? Now, it's the biggest growing vertical on the platform. Yeah. We just got the poll results in. So the number of video views um, is considered to be the most uh, important measure of success on YouTube or Vimeo. 40% uh, said that is most important. But also the number of channel subscribers and the view time, uh, roughly the same, 23%, uh, 27%. Um, so I think it's interesting that the view time is considered more and more important because that's, mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, um, people used to just click on videos um, and, and probably sometimes with the wrong title yeah. uh, that got a lot of views, but in reality, it's probably worthless um, yeah. clicks. Yeah, Rick rolled on YouTube all the time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Rick rolled, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's move on to uh, the academic studies side. I mean, basically, 
what is a what do you think is a good idea of somebody who studied filmmaking to move into a successful video and filmmaking career and what you know what are the fir the best first steps to making in the industry okay well um obviously there's so many different directions you could go if you want to be like an independent out and out filmmaker um you know a good path is actually tv um, so many productions being made in the TV world and you learn so quickly in TV. So as opposed to go out and make your own stuff independently, you'll, you'll make mistakes and when you come back to the edit suite, you'll see them all. Whereas broadcast is a bit different. There's so many people around, uh, production managers, etc. If you make any mistakes, you're told about it pretty much straight away. So you, you'll, you'll, you'll learn quicker maybe. But um, if you want to be independent, you know, there's so many outlets now to get your name out there, um, more funding opportunities. Um, Do most people find it. a job after they finish studying? Um, we, we, have find, quite a high, yeah. we have quite a high employment um, rate after leaving university. So, yeah, quite a lot of our students do go on to have successes in the industry. Uh, what I would say is I think that the, a lot of what you'll do when you come out of university will actually be on your own quite a lot, as we were sort of talking about before. You're not necessarily going to have the money to go and s set up big crews. Uh, there's not always, like, uh, as many opportunities around. So a lot of what you do, if you're working in, like, the corporate world, for example, you have to be on your own. So you really need to, like, have a very broad knowledge of, of everything. Of, of, you have to have a good idea of, of sound, of camera, of, of editing. You need to kind of be a jack of all trades in lots of ways, I think. So I think that would be, give you a good start in the industry to have a genuine interest in every yeah. aspect of the medium. How did you get started, Adrian? Well, uh, I started out in editing and making short films, which I shot <coughs> as well. But I got a job editing in the BBC in Bristol, which was a lovely environment for me to learn. And I did need to learn because I was initially very slow. The early days of Avid, and I was creeping all around the menus trying to find what I was doing as an editor. But I was allowed to learn on the job. And I became pretty good on Avid, Final Cut editing. And the most important thing about that was I was seeing everybody else's mistakes and cursing them under my breath all day <laughs> as I edited stuff. And I think being an editor, you, you often assume it might be easier than it is out there shooting, but you certainly see what works, you certainly see people's mistakes. And that motivated me to go out and shoot, which I've been doing for, for quite a while now. Um, but yeah, great start is editing because I think that's what people see at home. That's the end of the game. There's no lying there's no kind of tricking around it there what you see is what you get when you're in the edit suite i agree and uh, as a cameraman i have to say you are a better director of photography if you know how to edit especially your own stuff because you see all your mistakes you know didn't hold that shot long enough pan, you know too quick of a pan whatever yeah. it basically you make all the mistakes um, you stop making them if you edit your yeah. own stuff at the, some point. The, the only problem with editing that I think is a career choice, uh, which meant that I chose to move on from it, is that you don't meet many people in the yeah. edit suite. You're kind of there on your own and you're tidying up everyone else's mess and not generally <laughs> getting much credit for it because at the end of the day, the director and the producer are going to go out there and sort of sell the film to the world and your contribution is quite hidden. Editors are the unsung heroes of, of the business. And I think they still are even in this day and age. I think a lot of people starting out have a problem finding a way of being creative in our industry um, because the typical employed jobs that you get are production jobs, you know, PAs. And I started as a PA on big commercial productions, but very quickly moved on and then went freelance, basically, you know, trying to build up my own small video production business in the beginning. Um, and it worked quite well because I think people just have and it's a bold step to basically stop being employed if somebody has been for a while. Um, but being creative, like in a creative profession in our field, is very hard to be in an employed position, I think. Uh, I, th I think that's, uh, that's definitely something that's, that's changing. I think that with the affordability of uh, yeah. equipment at the moment, you know, students are coming out of university now and being able to set up with all the kit that they need to go out and shoot mini docs or, or YouTube blogs, for example, for less than like two thousand pounds, like probably even less than that. Uh, so they can go out there and start already building that that brand of their own filmmaking style. And yeah, they, I mean, to begin with, it's like it's like any startup. You might need to supplement that with uh, production jobs that you get with your other skills. <coughs> like that. But you can I mean, build towards that 
it's being main, your own boss, as it were. I think it's mainly, what, sorry. Yeah, I think what, what's changed in, in my sense of the market for video work as well is that I started off with my company, Many Hands Productions, which was just me, and yet it was called Many Hands Productions. <laughs> Occasionally, and now we work with a few more people, but back then the, the whole effort was to look like a bigger production company because it was assumed that then you'd get bigger work, bigger budgets, more interesting work. Actually, now the, the advertising agencies, the kind of interesting clients that are out there for video work, realise that they can get really good value from single filmmakers. And I think sometimes they're avoiding working with companies because they know that they need one guy and that one guy will give them better value for money. Well, even if an agency you know, goes to a bigger production company, there's very rarely any production company that has creative people employed. They just book them based on the job. Yeah. So you, know, you kind of have to be almost freelance to be creative in our industry. How, how do you find that um, progression in the YouTube space? How, with the, the people who come into the YouTube spaces, what's their progression like? Are they coming straight into it as a vlogger or do they come from production backgrounds? Or? It completely varies. Yeah. <clears throat> Although one thing I would like to highlight, I suppose, is so everyone that comes into the YouTube space, no matter what they're doing, say they're video blogging, they're making short films, they're doing all kinds of different things, all of them have, can edit, can shoot, can fix audio all yeah. on their own, can make titles for their own videos. So I think that just shows the competition that when you are coming out of university, you really do have to know all of this because you are competing against a huge audience of people now that know these skills as a very baseline. And I think that's something to kind of, you know, really register with yourselves when coming out of university. You need to be on your A game within knowledge in post and pre-production. Yeah, and production. That's yeah, and if you're gonna if you've already started out like that, which even I did years ago and people obviously are now, you're going to be that much more critical of somebody else when you've got a bit of a budget to get someone else on who's going to shoot for you or edit for you. They've really got to be a brilliant specialist now yeah. rather than just another jack of all trades. Completely, exactly. Yeah. Let's um, pose another question to our audience. How did you kickstart your career? Did you go to university? Did you start um, working? Um, right away as a volunteer or you know an intern uh, was anybody a runner did you start your YouTube channel or do you have yet do you have yet have to start um, questions on your screen now um, so but let's get back to the education part I mean you all mentioned that uh, yeah it's very practical these days because um, there's a certain amount of skills that's kind of required um, uh, to be accepted as a professional and uh, I mean this bar is getting higher and higher and higher which is a good thing uh, in general for, pr for productions but um, what do you think is, is, is it important to have a degree uh, is it important to have a proper <coughs> showreel you know what is it that differentiates people these days uh, I think it's I think to be honest if you've got a showreel with Tom Cruise in it or somebody famous popping up in it even if you shot them on your phone, that's still going to count for a lot more in this world than actually having a showreel shot beautifully um, from a helicopter or anything else. I think it's face recognition, name recognition. Celebrity is probably more important now than it ever has been. So I think work with famous people would be you just my... completely saw through my strategy there. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I just like to chip in. I don't think that you do need a degree. I, think, I know that's kind of strange coming from the academic side of things. I think that there is a lot that a degree can give you and a lot that a degree can say for you as well. Uh, I think it just comes down to having an extraordinary work ethic these days. Uh, and that's something that you can have at university or have outside of university. It's like you get what you put into your courses at uni and you get what you put into your... Uh, work experience opportunities outside of university. What university can give you is um, a real, a real structure, and put you in with like-minded people. So that and, and that networking side of things, like meeting people who are on the same level as you and have the same ambitions as you, and finding those production teams that you want to go on and work with in the future. Um, I think that that's one of the really valuable things. And and of course, we at, we at Solent offer loads of hands-on work experience as well. And those aren't opportunities that you'll necessarily get on your own, especially with like Glastonbury, for example, which is one of our clients. So, Yeah, I mean, it's all about work experience. There's some things that you can be taught on paper, but actually in the real world, when you're interviewing Tom Cruise or whatever, if you've had a bit of experience at that, it means next time you're a little bit more confident, but sometimes that can go a massive way in terms of actually breaking the industry and people watching on set Oh yeah, he seems to know what he's doing. Mm. That's a good thing. 
We just got the poll results in. Um, kind of underlines what you're all saying. 36% um, kickstarted their career with, in work experience. Um, but there were quite a few, 28%, who started with university. So still very, very relevant these days. Let's move on to uh, watching another video from you guys, uh, the Solent Festival's uh, trailer, and then talk about that. Cool. So this is what people produce in your production program. Um, how does it work? How do how do students still you know how are they still able to fulfill assignments? Because obviously these things take off take up a lot of their time. Well, the music festivals all occur over the summer, so that's all kind of done outside of student hours. It's all kind of done on their own back. Um, but we also do with Solent TV. Um, we help to run a module business of uh, film production? Yeah, so uh, there's, the Sony TV has actually started to integrate into the courses as well as being separate from the academic side of things. So we have a, a module called TV Business Practice, which is where Sony TV acts as a live client and gives briefs to students. And then they go off in production teams of two or three and go and fulfil our, our needs, creating entertainment videos uh, for the channel. And, and that is actually integrated into there. Course. So that is one of their um, one of the things they need to complete as part of the course, and that's a good way of integrating it with the festivals. Um, like like Craig says, they happen over over the summer, and they are they're they're purely work experience. They're not assessed academically, uh, but it's just such a, a boost to go and do one of these things for for the students' CVs, uh, and also like, as we were saying before, it's uh, you know a real intensive work experience you go there for real like you're you're running real stages recording live music and also going off and making documentaries in in the field in a field in a real field you know <laughs> so um it's just, it's just a fantastic opportunity for students yeah it's, it's great experience for them if you're on one of the outside broadcast cameras and you're filming i don't know who it might be fat boy slim or whoever it is and you've got like forty thousand people behind you watching your work live on the big screen that's what it's all about. And that's an experience that's quite hard to get sometimes in the industry because a lot of the camera operators to get that job have been working very hard themselves to get in that position. So the festivals are quite, quite a good thing at our university, really, because it gives you that opportunity. But also we do internal and external work for commercial clients, etc. So there's plenty of opportunities throughout yeah. the whole entire year. But yeah, I think the festivals so are... I mean, not everybody, uh, not every production needs that big production value and these big pieces of equipment, basically. But general question, what do you guys think um, are basic equipment, kit and competencies, requirements that you would recommend anybody to have if they are starting out in the industry? It's a very wide question, obviously, depending well, on I'm, what you do. I'm going to come in with the old-fashioned yeah. view here, but I think being able to write a clear brief or a clear email is really important because you know, any kind of content, be it on YouTube or elsewhere, is going to be determined by how clearly you've mapped out what you're going to shoot and the story you're going to tell. And I think too often people pick up a camera with, before they've thought about the importance of the content and why they're going to make it. Mm. And that has to happen basically on paper before people get into the flurry of production. And the more you think that through, the better the film's going to be. Well, let's talk a little bit about your personal experience. I mean, how did you get to make a feature film? Well, I, I was, uh, I've been making corporate videos for many years and getting quite efficient with them, not having to spend my entire week doing them. So I started writing about six different feature films. The one that bubbled up and came into production last summer is Redistributors, which is a, 
a thriller about a girl on the run from a military technology yep. company. Saw the trailer in the beginning. Yep, she she's, goes on the run and hides with a bunch of anti-capitalist protesters. And uh, that story seemed current and the script was in pretty good shape. So we got a team together last summer and went out and shot it. We used the Sony A7S camera, which meant that the focus was off the camera department. It was off the camera equipment. We didn't really need any lights. We were able to move smoothly through the world. We went to 31 different locations while we shot. And we did so um, using you know, the latest and most compact technology to do it. And um, I think, fingers crossed, it's turned out pretty well. We're into the last couple of weeks of post now. I heard some gaffers rolling their eyes when you said you didn't need any lights, but um, you're we did right. Have I mean... a few lights. We did have a few lights, but you know the, the camera was really important here. It, you know it, it has very good dynamic range, which meant that we didn't need to sculpt the light so much. Yeah. Um, and just being able to, because I was operating and I was directing, I had the thing hanging around my neck on the strap a lot of the time, literally like a tourist, mm -hmm. and I was able to move around without worrying about lights because. The more lighting you have, the more you tend to lock down the camera position and not be able to move freely with the actors, let them slows improvise. You down, right? And it slows you down and you're, you're longer between locations. So the whole point of this approach was to capture the world with the film. So it's very documentary feel, but we got to go everywhere. So you went really small with the A7S. Were you stable enough without any rig? Because I'm pretty stable. I recommend Birkenstocks and yoga. <laughs> to people who want to do handheld camera work. That steadies your body down and you can, I mean, you know, have to watch the film, but it's not that wobbly. And when, when it does get wobbly, that's generally appropriate to the story, which is, it's a thriller, it's a girl on the run. And when she's running, I'm generally running with the camera. But so. probably the new A7 Mark II or A7R II uh, with a built-in sensor stabilizer would have helped you, right? It, it would have <laughs> helped, yeah. But I mean, I, I had lenses with that stabilization on it and sometimes, you, you, you know, you can be better off switching it off handheld because it can give it a wafty feel. I, I'd love to try that though because I'm sure that they've worked on a better way of doing it. But a little bit of twitch and a little bit of wobble is actually quite useful when you're trying to tell a, a thriller story and keep yeah. it moving. What was the hardest part and the easiest part on such a huge project? I mean, that was your first feature film, so... Well, the time frame of it I think is quite interesting because I spent about six or seven years writing the script. So that did get a lot of scrutiny, a lot of slow, careful consideration went into the script. The shoot was then 27 days of mad flurry and not knowing what I was doing half the time. And then post has been the past 10 months of meticulous cleaning up and kind of sifting through the footage and tarting it up and using all kinds of plugins and effects to get the most out of it. And um, so, you know, the, the hardest part was probably you know, getting the script in shape. And when it was in shape, it attracted actors. We were able to see lots of actors have an, an exhaustive auditioning process and work with people who we knew were going to deliver. And that generally comes out of the fact that they do read the script, they do think about how it's going to be for them as actors to say this stuff. You know, like Harrison Ford said to George Lucas, like during Star Wars, some people you know, you can write this shit, but I certainly can't speak it. You know, and actors hate that. So you've got to have a good script that draws them to the film. And then when you get them, you've got to be really careful about knowing that they're right for the part, not just perhaps because somebody's better known than another actor. If they're not right for the part, then you're going to have to double check everything during the shoot and work all the time just to recalibrate their behavior for your story. So the best bet is to just get people who are going to do it first time. So how important is it to have A-list actors or known faces in your film? Well, I think with this film, uh, I hope I've got a lot of future A-list actors. I mean, some young cast like Alex Evans and Robert Bolton, who are both still like in their early 20s or, you know, 20s. And they're, they're I hope, going to go on to have huge careers. And some of the older actors are absolutely brilliant, but may not. Have, I mean, Jeff Rawls has been in Harry Potter and Drop the Dead Donkey. Um, so he's fairly well known. Ale Alistair McKenzie's done a lot of TV. So these are quite well known people and I hope they will bring their audience to the film. They have a lot of fans, but internationally recognizable names come with problems. You know, you're going to get the, the requirement of the insurance, the agent. I mean, we did have insurance, but we didn't have Tom Cruise level insurance, which would have cost thousands more. We didn't have to think about the hotels. We didn't have to think about the assistants. We didn't have to kind of worry too much. They were, they were good eggs. They were happy working mm. in a bit of a hectic environment. Catering wasn't always the best, but 
you know, people were very patient with us and it worked out. So Toby, if you would were to be, you know, marketing, promoting his film, yeah. what would you do? <laughs> Everything you know about YouTube. Um, I'll go back to the time of when he was uh, preparing it. <laughs> um, because I think there's a really good, interesting story here for you know aspiring filmmakers to go out and make a film, you know, um, on a low budget and with kind of such a small kind of equipment needs, but to create something that looks absolutely amazing. <coughs> That's a real like aspirational story. So to get that story across onto YouTube and to kind of build up an audience as you were making that would have been amazing. Um, we've seen kind of similar things done by the guys who do realm pictures. They made these underwater films and had a video blog as they were making it. And uh, that kind of drew up a huge audience <coughs> for when they actually finally did kind of make these things to go and watch them. Um, right now, I think it's all about clever marketing on YouTube, perhaps kind of create some kind of viral inspired it's sensation. Not too late, I hope. And, you know, no, definitely not. The focus was simply just on what went in the can. So, mm -hmm. You know, we really just only had time to focus on that film at the time. We didn't have the machinery to create interesting mm -hmm. content around it. But, you know, now we've still got a chance to perhaps document some of this process we're going through. And um, yeah, obviously, yeah. you know, I, I think the main thing is that the actual product itself mm -hmm. is something that, that we're proud of. Yeah, I mean, even the story from, you've got your film, how do I distribute it? That is a story in itself for the filmmaker who has gone <coughs> out there and created something. They're like, well, how do I share it with an audience? Yeah. That itself is a story and very shareable on YouTube because there's lots of aspirational filmmakers on the platform looking for people like you to kind of, you know, get inspired by. So what is your plan to promote it? Well, uh, the, the, the film now has a little bit of interest from sales agents who kind of take that, that pressure away from, from us to some extent. They go out and sell the film to <coughs> TV around the world, possibly to, to cinema and DVD if there's much of that left. Um, and then the film has, you know, potential for online sales, which, of course, is an incredibly efficient way of, of recouping money on a film because there's no cost in creating digital copies and selling them. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to talk about the film. I, I do agree. It's been personally a great adventure for me and meant a lot to me, even if the film doesn't make a penny. Um, it, it was really important for me to, to just make that, which my wife helped me make, but that split decision, which suddenly went, right, okay, we're going to go for it. And uh, that was my own decision. I wasn't greenlit by anyone else. Um, but I obviously needed a team to do that. And once I felt I had a team, I was confident with. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm open to all offers in terms of how <laughs> people might want to take this and make it a bigger thing now. I'm fascinated that you decided to direct this and be director of photography. I mean, you know, knowing how hard it is to actually direct actors um, and do camera at the same time, it's kind yeah, of a... But I, I love DPs, like yourself, I'm fascinated with DPs. I'm one myself. I would have spent most of my time chatting to the DP about the lenses <clears> and the look and ignored the actors because I'm a little bit, that's a bit more within my comfort zone. I'm a bit of a techie. That would have been my default mode of talking to them and ignoring the actors. It's quite a big move for me to embrace that kind of more fluffy thing, which is acting and the, the talent that that involves. But with this tiny camera hanging around my neck, I was able to talk to them a lot. And actually, you know, we got some nice looking shots, but we didn't really, um, you know, we weren't distracted by that. Even if I'd had a great DP and crew, that clunky bit of kit that I'm not going to name any cameras, but half of them I picked them up at shows and thought, my God, am I going to hold that all day? <laughs> you know, and, and even if someone else is doing it, just having that big block of equipment and often fascinating bits and bobs in front of you and the actors is, is a very distancing thing. And, you know, also distancing between us and the environment we were in. So we were able to go out and shoot with just me sometimes and the leading actress, Alex. We'd be on the tube getting shots. We'd be on the streets. And we couldn't have done that with bigger equipment. We couldn't have moved as fast with bigger equipment. And we would have just, you know, we would have altered the world around us. Like, you can shoot in a crowd and get free extras. That's easy to do, right? But if you've got a big camera rig with a shoulder mount or a light, everyone's going to be looking at that camera and it's not going to work because you won't be able to use those shots. So you basically were shooting without with permissions that, on the A7s. Yeah, without permissions <laughs> and without anyone in the public thinking that, that we were filming. So... Yeah. Uh, that meant that their behaviour was really natural. They were like the best extras you could imagine, more natural than mm. extras who were, are aspiring actors. I find, apart from its low-light sensitivity, uh, the A7S, I find myself using that very often these days 
because of the E mount. I mean, don't you agree? I mean, basically, I can use every lens I have and every lens that anybody yeah. has because you can adapt anything to it. Uh, what lenses did you use for well, shooting? Well, I, I used a, a lovely lens for nearly all the film. I've got quite a lot of lenses. I've got about six or seven lenses at home, um, all of which are nice and all of which would work on it. But I ended up with an 18 to 35 1.8 lens. And um, I found that that would give me a, a wide shot where it was likely to be in focus, it was safe. And then I could zoom into that 35 and get a, a shallow depth of field close up where I needed it. And I found after a while that I wasn't taking that lens off. I shot nearly the whole film. I had a 50 occasionally for, um, you know, for certain shots and I had a hundred, but I generally just kept with the 35. Cool, yeah, so you was versatile enough to stay the same and you could focus on the acting um, not yeah, too could, much on the camera. <laughs> and I could shoot it documentary style and you know we, it, it was a great adventure making the film. We had a, you know, 31 locations. We went round the world. I got out and about more than I normally do sitting at home editing. And um, in a way the film captures some of that journey because we were able to travel very light and keep moving and the story is a chase story so it keeps moving from yeah. one location to another. And did you edit the film as well? Uh, well, I had a really good editor called John Dean on the film, and he, he did three months of work on it, but he had to move on. So I've been editing it for about six months. And um, I, as I say, I used to be an editor, so I just love getting home with some drama footage that I've shot or, you know, that, that somebody good has shot and being able to cut that, because to me that's where I always started out, loving that kind of film. And uh, knowing that you've safely got it in the can and you've backed it up, and you're sitting at home, that, that feeling of relaxation and triumph when you get back and you just know you've got it is, is fantastic. Well, now that our audience has heard a lot of different approaches and a lot of different careers from our industry, um, what is your personal long-term career goal? You want to be a feature film director? You might be, bit, be a bit biased now because of Adrian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, do you want to be a success online? Do you want to become a director of photography uh, or having your own company? Um, questions on your screen now. So let's wrap this up. Um, just very briefly, each one of you, what are a few tips and tricks that you would give somebody starting out in the industry? If it's just, you know, in a few words. Okay, um, mine would be to learn everything. So essentially teach yourself nonlinear editing, software, cameras, uh, composition, 2D animation, and audio design, because and a little bit of graphic design too. You should be starting as your baseline with all of those, with that knowledge for all of those kind of encompassing, you know, techniques, because that is what everyone on YouTube is doing. I agree with that, but I'd say don't get too bogged down in the technical stuff. Think about what you're going to make as a text first. Is it going to be a compelling email? Is it going to be a good pitch, a good treatment? Is there a meaning and a message to the film you're going to make? And then that should shape how all the technical stuff is done around it. Um, from an academic's perspective, I say a university degree is quite useful. We give you a massive blend of all these different skills that you should learn. But you've also got your own time to do work experience, jump on different productions, gives you a real good uh, grounding uh, for the industry when you graduate. Uh, I would say look at like uh, uh, consume as much media as possible uh, look at what other people are doing so uh, and what people have done in the past and what your peers are doing so that you can find ways of being genuinely innovative and not just a hack and also uh, be a nice person as well it will, it will get you really far <laughs> to be to be friendly and to be personable uh, I think yeah, that's a very good point it's a yeah. very very social <laughs> job we all have. Sure. Absolutely. If you can't do deal with people, you should probably be an editor <laughs> at the most. I'm not, well, I'm not pointing at you. In no, this day and world, it's quite easy to fall into that trap. If you're heavy on like editing, visual effects, yeah. after effects, we come to a lot of students who have done a bit of that before they come to us, and they're quite geeky and hard to approach, and not the greatest communication skills. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a real those, blend. Yeah, and, and those jobs that aren't personally connecting with other people are soon going to be done around the world in China or India or wherever labour's <laughs> cheaper because, you know, you can get your VFX sent off, you can get your grading sent off, you can get your, you know, editing even now. There's some of these systems for uploading footage and 
paying an editor anywhere in the world. So I would say, you know, those jobs may be in danger in the future because of the net. Cool. So let's move on to audience questions. I have a few here. Uh, first one from Gernot Goebel, sounds a German, like a German name. Uh, what is your definition of success? Generating income, social media attention, and how do you measure it? Well, I was glad that the I was glad that the earlier poll came up with lifestyle being really important because, as much as it's brilliant to be creative and use these fantastic tools and be it, you know, we're all really lucky. We're at the cutting edge of technology. Life's going to just get better and better for us because we're using stuff that's right on the cusp of technology. But your lifestyle has to be controllable, and I think working really long shoots, working kind of some of the hours that people think are cool within the film industry mm. is not conducive. I used to enjoy it when I was younger, but it's not conducive to family life. And actually, I don't think it's really good for creativity either. We also just, just got the poll results in. Uh, what is your long-term goal? Any guesses? Do people want to be film directors? You think? Yeah. I, I thought the same. Okay. Nope. It's having my own company, 32%. A me media company or just any? Uh, yeah, I think film production company. Yeah, well, sure. Maybe it's just a <laughs> company, yeah. It's only 17.9% who said uh, they want to create their own feature film. I'm surprised by that. But I mean, that, but that does tie in with job satisfaction, maybe. Because surely, if you're, yeah. if you're your own boss and you own your own company, mm -hmm. if you're not satisfied, then you've somehow messed up somewhere. Don't Slightly you? worrying, though. You think, like, uh, possibly people. Of wanting to make content for being artists and creativity. Yeah. No, I agree. I think it, I think it's a bit sad that people are, you know, are, are focusing on something that is a, a kind of abstract, slightly Thatcherite, um, uh, you know, ambition that you're just going to have a little business and part, be functioning like that. It matters what that business does. It matters what you do and what your lifestyle is like. Yeah, I think just yeah, having I think a business is with, not that enough. Goes with, um, the idea, I think the idea is more to have the, f the freedom to go and make the content you want. You're mm -hmm. not just necessarily like on the ground level making content for whoever. And, and having your own business is, gives you that power to make those decisions about, well, is this the kind of content I want to be making? And if it isn't, you can say, well, I'm the boss. No, yeah. I'm not going to make this Yeah, I, I, I was very scared of the idea of having my own business for many years because I thought the bureaucracy would be impossible. I thought I'd be sued by people or I'd be you know, bankrupted or whatever. And in fact, that, that's a really minor hurdle. It, it, in fact, it's quite empowering to have your own business. It makes you more resilient. You can say no to clients if you have to mm. uh, and know that you're not going to be sacked by somebody else. Yeah. Um, so I definitely recommend it. I just think it, it's an easy start. It's not the end. You know, start by having your own business, then aim to make content that you're proud of. Let's move on to another audience question. De uh, David Martinez Ortega asks, how to spread your work properly through YouTube? Probably he means how much, you know, how do you get views? How do you make people watch stuff? So there's a whole host of different kind of channel and uh, video optimization, which we do cover at the YouTube Space London, if you want to go there. Um, but essentially, it depends what kind of content you're making, because there's different strategies for different types of content. If you're making a daily vlog, it's a completely different strategy to whether you're making a short film every three months. It really depends. Um, I would say what we mentioned before, collaboration, putting your work, grabbing different audiences from different places, utilizing different social media platforms to the, you know, the utmost degree, that's all going to help you go a long way. Yeah. So the next question we have is from Larry Bartolome. Uh, which editing suite would, you, would be most uh, useful should I choose one? What I you guys that. I'm a big Final Cut Pro X guy. I find it saves me so much time. That's very great to hear because I'm too. Yeah. We, we are not many. It's just great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I personally think that if you're if you're just getting started in editing, I don't think it really particularly matters wh which one you pick. I think that you pick the one that you can afford and learn well. Um, I, I mean, I personally use the Adobe Creative Suite. That's what we've got at work. But I've also used Final Cut. I've I've, I've tried them all out. I think that they're all they all do different things and have different entry. Levels, and I think you've just got to find what's right for you. It's a creative thing, editing. So you just find where you can be most creative. I think you have to bear in mind, though, that your edit suite of choice talks to other people because, yeah. you know, if you're working on a... Yeah. You might really like an obscure one from the 90s, <laughs> uh, you know, 1.0, whatever, and then that's no good to you because once you start sharing work with other people wanting sound mix or grade, you're in trouble. So it's worth choosing stuff that other people also use. 
I also think, um, from my own experience, as soon as you can jump into 2D animation in After Effects, you'll be able to show your client stuff that it, like pops, goes bang, they're great. And all that stuff you cannot do with an editing program itself. So as soon as you take it into like After Effects, the next level, you can really wow a client very easily. Yeah, I mean that, you know, when I started out making videos for people, I was the only person with a camera in the room, in the house. You know, I'd, I'd have that status. Everyone get a bit excited when I'd show up. I had a camera. Now, everybody's got a camera in their pocket. And so they feel like they understand filmmaking. But when you show them After Effects, you're really, it's magic to a lot of people. And mm -hmm. you're entering that level where it's very easy to wow yeah. people. We have another question, which is gear related. Um, which camera would I recommend a7S or A7R2? Um, I think it really depends. I mean, you, you use the A7S. I love this camera. I have two of them. Um, they're super low light sensitive. It's probably the most light sensitive camera I know on the market, um, which enabled you to shoot yeah, I mean, it, it almost was, everywhere. Yeah, I mean, my film was a genre that I heard about in Cannes this year, I didn't really know it exists, called Neon Noir. <laughs> and it is a genre that people make. And the best example of that is probably a film like Collateral, which was yeah. one of the first films to use digital because they wanted to show the city at night. And that was my aesthetic too. I wanted to show that. And I still think the A7S is probably the best camera to do that because you're getting all that energy of those lights, that lovely bouquet in the background of your characters with the colorful lights. The new A7R2 has the stabilized sensor in it, which is a benefit, and it's more light sensitive than the A7R, the original one. Right. And you have internal 4K, which is good, of course, for feature film. So it's, you know, it really depends on what you want, I think. If, if like in your case, the low light sensitivity is the most important thing, I would definitely go for the A7S. But if you, you, know, you want high resolution, and especially the stabilized sensor, the A7R2 is definitely the way to go, but it's it's a hard choice. I mean, well, for uh, indie filmmakers, I guess a big thing is cost as well. So the A7S yeah. is a bit cheaper, so yeah, that helps. It's amazing though how each camera gets better. I'd always want the latest one. Yeah, they're like computers now. Like every 18 months, the nearest greatest things out. Yeah, people want that. Yeah. Let's take one last question from a viewer who I actually know personally, Dominic Shar. He attended one of the uh, workshops that um, we did in Brighton. Um, I just lost the question, but I think I remembered. Um, it's how do you get started online uh, and make a successful uh, career online? Very open question. It depends what you want to do online, but I just think tell your story. Um, reach people on an incredible and authentic level and you'll attract an audience. What do you think, Andrew? I, again, I'd go back to say, think about what you're going to say. And, you know, in the old days, you'd have been writing it down with a quill pen and, you know, a vellum book. But you, you, you've got to have some I mean, some specifically kind of online, you know, what yeah, a career but on, online. You know, online Still. actually is, is as, as reliant on content and, and, and story and message as anything else. And I think, you know, some of these most successful YouTubers, I think they might write down before they vlog and they memorize what they're going to say. But like a stand-up comedian, it's, mm -hmm. it's about the book, it's about what they've kind of coalesced into a coherent thought before they, they go and pick up a camera or anything. So again, I'd say, you know, think about what it's going to be, do the writing first, and then do it. Don't just think you can improvise a message. Yeah. I want to add something which is, you know, do, when you do great work, talk about it be public about it. I know a lot of gr people who do great work and never put it online. It's like, yeah. why? I think <laughs> the, the key is to really like, be passionate about what you're doing. Whatever it is you're doing, you have to be passionate about it. And then that, that just filters through. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Like it, it filters into the writing, it filters into the production, and it filters into the way that you communicate with your audiences afterwards. It has to be from a passionate place, basically, I would say. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say give, give stuff away as well, really, because, yeah. you know, I, I made some shorts which have got distribution, and they, they do make me a bit of money. But in a way, some of those I would have been better off just saying, hey, look, just let's release this, let everyone watch it for free, because it would be good for my brand. I absolutely and, agree. I think, uh, you know, you, your audience just grows if you give it away. I mean, it's obviously hard with the feature film, all the costs involved. Yeah, but everything really surrounding that, that and everything everything you do, like even if it's like camera reviews like we do and stuff like that, try to be as creative as possible. Give it away for free because it is so much more that you get back in the yeah. very end. Okay, so let's wrap it up here. That was a really interesting session. Thank you, guys. Um,
thank you all for watching. Um, don't forget that you can still join the conversation using the hashtag MakeTheBreak. Um, if you go to the Sony Professional website, there's a lot of uh, free, great content online uh, for training and you know learning stuff in the industry, especially technical stuff, of course. And please um, do look out for the recording of this. Uh, we'll be online next week uh, by the latest, um, <clears throat> and you can rewatch it. And please do fill out the survey that we put up after this webinar. It helps Sony to improve these webinars for future uh, broadcasts. So thanks again for watching and see you soon.